Oh no, I got the pinwheel of death. Hold on. I think, it, I think it notifies us sooner than it notifies you. But yeah. Yeah, no, it, that's that's true. Uh, all right. YouTube link. All right, and we are live. Welcome everybody to another exciting edition of Office Hours. This is September 8th Office Hours. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Office Hours or if you're seeing this later, uh, this is really your chance to come ask us questions, uh, your chance to, to talk to us about some of the things that we're up to, and then our chance to solicit feedback from you on things that we're planning or things that are up and coming. Um, so please feel free to chime in whenever you'd like, uh, and we're happy to, to answer questions or hear ideas or be a sounding board, whatever you kind of need from us. Um, so please feel free, anybody, to just jump in and we will be sure to help you out. Um, and with that, I believe we just have... Uh, few things on the schedule and I will turn it over to you AJ to get into that in depth. Oh, muted. Yeah so uh, I think we were going to talk about I think you, as you posted Amanda the productionization and deployment. Um, uh, Ken has been working on that um, and then another one that I wanted to go over was the um, the progress we made on uh, database type streams which is a, something we wanted to include in V1 of the SDK when we launch our official V1. Um, aside from that, um, I'll, I, we generally like to solicit topics from uh, anybody who's joined us here in Zoom. Uh, so if you have a topic and you're in Zoom, you can put it in the chat. Um, in a few minutes, we'll probably just like say hello to everybody and, um, and ask you if there's anything in particular. Um, but to get started, um, should we start with um, the deployments process or maybe uh, jump in a database type streams? Any preference? Um, let's start with database type streams. Um, I and I'll share my screen here. Oh, I need permission on that, Amanda. If you can give me co-host, I'll share. There. There we are. Good to go. Cool. Thanks. So uh, here is our office hours board, uh, which we use to plan uh, kind of discussions for this session. Um, last third, last I think we discussed this briefly on Wednesday uh, last week, but we actually dove in and built something in a live coding session on Thursday. And the result of that, um, I think it's worth revisiting now um, and use it to gather feedback on this model, uh, what can be improved, uh, what can, what, what works well, what, what do we like? So I'm going to actually dive into, I don't think I've linked it on this issue and it was, um, is it, uh, it was tap Athena and this looks right. So it's in our Meltano labs, um, org and I guess I'm already <laughs> in the source code, but just to show everybody, uh, here it is. This is something we just built last week. So you can see all of these are six days ago. Um, and uh, right now there's no PyPy image. Again, this, this is a little bit kind of under development still, but um, we've this is the config expected. Basically just needs to know AWS credentials, a place to put S3 files, um, and then, well, an, a region, and then a schema name in Lambda. Um, Lambda's, I mean, sorry, Athena. Athena's nice because it's almost no footprint. And it just, it, it's easy to get set up and there's no always on cost. Um, so, but let me just walk through the source code real quick. Um, if you've never built a tap before, um, some of this will be new. Um, if you have built a tap before, um, this will be new, but a little bit different. Um, with any tap, we have some properties. Um, in this case, we had to override this catalog dictionary um, declaration just to either pass on the input catalog directly or run discovery, um, which we'll get to in a sec. And then this discovered streams we overwrote. So really on this tap, there's only about 12 lines of code um, that we put on the tap definition. And I'll show you in a sec the stream definition. I wanna pause here though, cause I know Derek, you've built a database tap um, uh, and anyone else who wants to chime in, um, any any questions or thoughts on this? I was wondering if, if this part couldn't be uh, just handled for us. And so we wouldn't have to override this. And in fact, even this part might be overridable. Um, but but I don't, I mean, sorry, it might be defaultable uh, if we just knew the name of the class. 
But um, what do you think? Yeah, so I've dove in. I've done a target. I haven't done a tap oh, okay. from SQL. No, I've dove into pretty deep into the Oracle tap and the MS SQL tap. So I, I do know about them decently. Um, yeah, I, I, I wonder, like, I, I know some people, like, you can override a lot of things in the catalog. So, like, if you're pulling data from Postgres, some people, I think you can go in and even change the data types in the catalog. Sometimes right. people do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. It's it's interesting to me um, that they're so it gets so complicated. Is my brain goes to like, okay, I want to do weird things like um, sometimes I want to customize my own stream. Like I want to use something more than just listen the database. I want to write my own SQL thing and run that. And and I know that's not what you're trying to do here. So I I, I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> oh, uh, no, I think that's very helpful, and it brings up. Um... It brings up, it brings me back to that issue. And this item number four, I think, is um, yeah, it, got it. Is 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 it? And and this is the approach here. So for a traditional tap, you declare all the streams as traditional, being like an API type type. You declare fifteen stream types, and you say, okay, well, each stream uh, knows its schema. The collection of those fifteen schemas is going to be your catalog. Um, it's just fundamentally different with the database, which is that we start with a catalog, either detected or provided, customized by the user. And then we assume all those tables and columns exist and we just try to query them. So I do think there's a shift here that the catalog becomes the authoritative thing and there aren't different classes for every table because that would be a waste, obviously. Like you wouldn't have 200 classes for 200 tables. Uh, so uh, yeah, so this is that point. And what we're, the way we're showing that here is that instead of, th this is reversed in tradition in API-based streams. Um, the discover stream um, actually, um, this is actually a collection of classes in, in an API tape stream. And then this is just a collection. So it's just kind of switching around. Um, and I'm not showing this very well, but catalog dict here is just referencing here. So whether we get it through discovery um, or whether we get it through the input, the streams are defined by the catalog, now, which does mean you could override data types. You could define tables or views that aren't even scannable. Like if there was an invisible table that nobody could see, uh, you could still, th in theory, just define a catalog for it and the tap would try to get it. Yeah, I, I think about cool things you could do there. I, I, I just, I don't know enough about like making it generic to every single database type, but I think about like uh, SQL, I know, I think Taylor talked about it way back when, when we were messing with the idea of like querying the database directly, like, yeah, defining a custom view instead of making it in your database, you could theoretically do it in the catalog. I don't know if that buys much for many people, but yeah, I don't know. Those are ideas. I, I, I love it. It sounds great. Oh. I mean, to make this faster, I, the MS SQL taps that are out there right now, they're not good. So um, yeah. I, I say that. Um, <laughs> there's just pieces that I don't like, but um. that's fair. I mean, it's, it's hard to write it from scratch. And what we're trying to do is reuse as much of the good uh, plumbing we've got for the entire SDK in an easy way. Um, pardon my dog grabbing a squeaky toy. Um, I'm not sure if that's showing up on the mic. Uh, so, but I want to, um, I, I just realized, I don't know why I didn't think of this sooner. We can just put this into the cookie cutter. Like I wrote this by hand because we're adapting from a custom stream type. But actually, if we just define the cookie cutter as a database type, and then this code it almost could exactly just be boilerplated. Uh, yeah, there's nothing here except the name of the source being parameter, like Athena, uh, and everything else could be generic. So actually, yeah, I, I kind of, yeah. Okay, let's go to the next, the next one. This, this is helpful. Um, so then if, if we did have this as the boilerplate of, out of the cookie cutter for database type streams, um, this would all come out of box and you'd only just need to override the properties you need. And then we'll see on the next screen where they're, um, where they're used. So if we go to, um, we don't need very many classes here. Uh, they, we don't even need to define multiple stream types or off. Um, oh gosh, and this is embarrassingly simple. Uh, the only thing we do here is to find the get SQL Alchemy URL, because we're relying on SQL Alchemy for discovery and at least for a base level select capability, um, this is it. I think what we should do is provide in the cookie cutter like a, an option to override 
um, the get records call if you wanted to get a faster implementation or provide some sample for batching when we get to batching. Um, yeah, I, I like one thing I've noticed is like the assumption tends to be in the Singer ecosystem, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, I, I tend to just say things and they're way off. Um, the the assumption tends to be that people own the database they're pulling the data from. And I, I say that because like um, doing a copy is faster, right? If you can pull the CSV or if you can like just pull the data and make a CSV to do a bulk upload, like that's what everyone keeps talking about with the database things. There, there's times in my use case is where I don't own the database, but I might get access to it. Um, and I, that's where selects make a ton of sense. Just, hey, select star from these things. It's not 10 billion records. I can get away with selecting them, but it's slow because I have, you know, a thousand streams or let's say a hundred different tables I'm pulling from. If I could thread those out, that's another big help would be if I could make a bunch of them. And I don't know if that's Melturbo yeah. or if you should bake it into the database tabs. That's both. what I'm asking. Yeah, both probably. Um... Yeah, so so we have. I think we have another issue in the SDK about par running things in parallel, um, and and anything we build generically will apply to these as well. So I think right now we don't have a multi-threading uh, or or you know async solution for getting it all at the same time, but we should. Um, one one thing I'm I'm realizing also this is because it's so little code. Maybe we should just put it together all in one file. What do you guys think about having this stream definition just right below the tap definition so it's all there in one place? Yeah. Sounds good to me. It's so small. Like look, yeah. at, the, look at the tap oracle and the other yeah. tabs that are out there. There it's so much to jump through. There's yeah, so we're much like, state moving around. We're like 11 lines of code here. Um yeah, okay. but I, I think I think quite a lot of that in the existing um, taps is particularly to handle the, as you said, like the different methods of replication. So select is is definitely the kind of most universal. If you don't own the database, you get access, you can at least do selects in most cases, but it's also super low fidelity. You have to have primary keys if you want to do incremental, otherwise you're doing full table. And even if you have incremental keys, um, if deletions aren't flagged in the upstream application, you, you're not getting deletions. So it's, it's a very kind of like low fidelity way of replicating data. To remedy that, there are a few things you can do. You can do full table on some kind of schedule so that at least like midnight on Sunday, you're up to date again, and then you just drift for the rest of the week, and then you're up to date again. Like there are ways to patch it, but broadly- um, uh, Or you just go you, full every time. Yeah, exactly. But over a certain table size, that's just, it's not good for the database. You'll start not making friends on whoever owns the database. And it's not really great for, for you either because you're just like throwing compute against the wall for, for no reason. Um, so like there are other ways to do it. For, for require... business value, just, just so you know, like customers that I work with, like literally it's, they don't care at all about that cost. It's people time. I'm just telling you, like, I understand the mentality and, I, and it's correct. It's just like, I, that, that's literally the mentality that I'm dealing with is I don't care, it's business value. I do not care how much compute it costs, right? So yeah, no, just, 100%. Yeah. I think my, my experience in, in startups where the you're working with developers who own the database, they would rather having a, like a, a high touch, high fidelity replication of the database. Like they, they care more about the, the solution. It's not some sort of like anonymous team that you just want to like sync the data from and, 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 and pass downstream. So I think there is definitely a, and, and as I said, I think there's definitely a place for select, but having it as always the like first thing that everybody reaches for as part of the tap and target implementation doesn't really service the, the broadest use case the best, right? Like people who, who don't know the caveats of like you need, primary keys that are incremental and even with primary keys and incremental, you're not going to catch deletions are going to assume that they've got a very high fidelity sync when in, in actual terms, they, they really don't. So I think there is an opportunity to um, uh, make log based much more the like log based or the, the, the table replications where you get a system table with updates, those kinds of replication um, much more at the forefront and then have the incremental and full table as, as fallback select star options. So I, I get what you're saying there, and I, I'm sorry to offer. I always offer this contrarian view sometimes. The, um, oh, it's great. Mm -hmm. So just yell at me; it's fine. But I think a lot of that comes from the targets. Like the targets themselves are all set up with that assumption in mind. It, 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 if couldn't you like, I just wrote my own target for MS SQL, and I do full tables every time. And it, it's 
for incrementals, it's horrible. It won't work. But for full mm-hmm. tables, it's great. It works every time. Um, so it kind of throws that idea on its head. But I, I don't know. It's just another idea. And I'm just so throwing it out there I'm gonna just, try. just to muddy the waters. I'm going to try to pull us back a little bit. Um, so Derek, I think you're making a really good case for, and you've made this case also, I think, in, in another uh, Ops Hour session. For a lot of use cases, um, u- users should consider just defaulting to full table and just doing simpler because saving those pennies is not as valuable. It's just the assurance to know that you're getting all the data. I think that's a point well made. Um, there are cases where a pipe, like especially when you're getting to very large data sets, uh, uh, the data pipeline just won't finish in time. Like it, it'll just take too long. It'll be running for 17 hours. It's just not reasonable to run that daily. And so we do need things like uh, incremental and uh, to to capture also deletions and sometimes to reduce load on the database. Log base is super handy. So um, the way I'm going to try to pull pull us back to this this conversation is maybe we keep these as separate files so that we can like put some boilerplate in there of these generic uh these generics um uh, or like some like the the placeholders for how does somebody put a log based implementation in here how does somebody put a, a batch implementation here if they want to um i guess yeah could, sorry the, the original yeah. point i was making is the reason why there's a lot of code in some yeah. of these other taps is they're handling that case of yeah. even if you configure log based if there is no log on the server to go and fetch, it will f- fall back onto full table, do a backfill, um, and, and then continue on with log based in the future. So even if a single stream is configured with log based, if you look at some of the, particularly the, the wise um, taps, uh, mm-hmm. they will fall back onto other replication methods, even if you explicitly configure a uh, log based, because there are limitations on if there just isn't a log there for, a, for, for it to consume or it's it, the, the log that's in the bookmark no longer exists. You have to do a full table before you can then continue streaming from the logs. So I think there's that's where a lot of the complexity comes from in the existing taps. Yeah. So let's um, maybe let's bookmark this for a future discussion. I think that we'll uncover a lot of this complexity when we get to batch messaging and when we get to log based replication, um, which I think have their own issues. And those will kind of build on this. Uh, and in the meanwhile, if we can find kind of sample cases or anybody in the community wants to build on this preview and uh, no understanding that it's still a preview stage, uh, if you want to build on this, um, a SQL uh, tap. Uh, and provide us feedback or maybe help us solve these problems the first time through. Um, that's always really valuable to have real world use cases to build the log based implementation, for instance. And what does that contract look like? Is there a can run log based method that you override? And then you just like tell the SDK if it's possible or not, even depending on, regardless of what the user wants to run, is it even possible? And you report that back and then it forks depending on. I don't know, there's a lot to solve there. And I don't want to get too deep into that. Um, I think for this discussion. I have what I need. This is really valuable feedback uh, and I really appreciate it. Um, I do feel like we've we've made a lot of progress here on the on the database type implementation uh, and I'm looking forward to to leveraging it for some real database taps. Um, and also um, some of these act this model can actually also be used for the target side. Again, it's simplistic and only solves some of it. But for instance, detecting column types, detecting if it needs to add a column or alter a column, or if the types are compatible, some of that stuff can be written generically um, so that a target implementation on the SDK might just say, hey, I've got a stream coming through with 12 columns. My table only has 10 columns, help. And it would just know to add those two columns um, with some hints uh, rather than um, than having to each tar- target developer having to handle that in- separately. But that is a separate conversation from this. It's kind of un- unclear. I don't want to promise too much on how much the SDK can just solve for us, but uh, it's very promising with the capability SQL Alchemy has. And, um, and because SQL Alchemy is written generically, it has things like add column for the things that we need to use generically, they're not performance constrained, like adding a column is never a performance intensive operation. Uh, so it's not really something we'd tune for performance reasons. Um, so anyway, more, more to follow on that topic. And with that, um, I think, Ken, do you want to kick off the the um, kind of deployments and infrastructure conversations? Or actually, I, I'm sorry to, to mislead. Um, Zach and Bogdan, I did want to ask you, I just want to say welcome. Um, and are there any topics you'd like to hear us talk about today, or if you'd like to join in any specific topics um, for today? 
Thanks, thanks. I, I am very interested in the deployment. Uh, in my project, I am beginning in that part, so it's going to be important to see your recommendation. Fantastic. Welcome. And Zach? Uh, I don't think I have anything. Do you, would you happen to have documentation on uh, how you go about, go about prioritizing certain tasks and targets? Do you mean in terms of adding them to the hub or in terms of, uh, how, what, so can you say a little more about that? So like, uh, I suppose it's two parts. Mm -hmm. Like what is the thinking behind the development? Like why you choose to go this route versus that route? Uh, and I suppose like what development phase these taps are in? Yeah. And maybe that's something that could be found on GitLab. So we're, uh, that's a great question. And, and I think it's um, a good one to, for us to speak to. We actually are trying to not be in the business of building taps. Um, the exception is when we need a sample use case for the SDK that we're building, like is this uh -huh. case, or or when we ourselves as a business have a need for a certain solve. So like we needed a tap Git lab. So we built one um, and we need a target Athena for the hub. So we built one. Um, but in general, um, we rely on the community and it's actually been very successful to rely on the community because there are more taps out there than we could possibly support. Um, I think there's some valid discussion on should, should Meltano be focusing on any like adding additional support or at least, you know, kind of bringing attention to certain taps and targets. Uh, but, but yeah, right now it's, it's up to the, it's, it is driven by the community fundamentally. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. Are there taps or targets you'd like to see that are kind of prompting this uh, this discussion, this question? Yeah, well, so the discussion at Tap Athena, I was just like looking at the, the yeah. repo and that is so, like, the way that it's being developed is very simple and straightforward. Uh, I think it's easy for anyone who's like jumping, you know, not into Singer, but into Meltano to like uh, figure out how they should set up the configuration file. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm using target Athena. It's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, I suppose mixed messaging. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, I am the community developer who wrote target Athena um, uh, with actually with, with, with what I help with actually and, and Andrew Stevens uh, in the community, but I, I've, I've played a role in that one. Um, and yeah, there's more we can do. Um, this is this is something, what, what you'll find a lot is that for these things that maybe two people have developed together, we built it for our use case. And when we had our use case solved, we kind of move on to the next thing. Um, and that can be frustrating, but over time, um, that's a very young target, um, mm -hmm. but over time, the community will, will help support. Like you hopefully, if you want to use this, might help improve our documentation or, you know, um, or even just point out to us where our documentation is lacking. And then we'll just like, oh yeah, I didn't think how that could have been confusing. And we can step up. Um, it is an independent thing um, per tap and target, but the hub is our attempt to make it universal and, and have it stand in one place. Um, so in the hub, we're hoping, and also by by getting metadata on what, what settings are supported and stuff documented in the hub, it should be a one-stop shop. And we're not yet on that vision. The hub is still new as well. Uh -huh. Dawa, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think you've, you've covered pretty well. Uh, if there are specific questions, you know, I can, can try to answer them. But um, yeah. yeah, the way we're going about it is really empowering the community to build the connectors they need. And uh, we will focus on the tools and the infrastructure and which includes things like the SDK and the hub. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately, it is up to the community to decide where they want to put their efforts. Uh, and there are, of course, in the community also some consultants that you can actually hire to build depths and targets for you. Uh, Derek can mm. raise his hand. This is one of them. Uh, if it's not something that you uh, want to invest time in yourself. Yeah, I think um, we talked briefly in our discussion about the hub uh, a few weeks ago that maybe having a place to just sort of like list and, and maybe thumbs up um uh stuff that you'd love to see uh, might be a cool feature cool feature for the hub yeah I, I was thinking about launching something but if you guys would rather do it publicly we could do that i haven't put work into it yet so whatever you guys want to do yeah, uh but... yeah let's let's chat about that um, uh, I think that's... in terms of the, the usability issues on target athena 
Um, I would, I would, you can drop an issue in there and just be like, Hey, I don't understand how to run this. And that's totally sufficient. If you just want to drop an issue on that, because this is decentralized and decentralized on purpose. Um, it, it, it's not like Meltano can solve the documentation issues on any tap or target. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but especially for something like that, where we, we still are, we're still looking at it. We're still using it. It's not in any way like stagnant. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll get a response if you post an issue. Um, uh, and, yeah. Yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I was just saying, thank you. Yeah. Um, and one other, I suppose this is just a side bit of information, but I happen to like, connect with the, with prefect CTO some time ago. Um, so I have his email in case that's helpful. Cool. Uh, you said prefect. Yeah, prefect. Yeah, I think we have an issue to integrate with them. Yeah. Okay. I can give you the email of the guy. Cool. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll chat offline. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Zach. That'd be appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, what if I... Yeah, I do appreciate that feedback on the target Athena. And I think overall, um, this, this actually leads me to one thing that I, um, I've been meaning to log an issue on and haven't yet. Uh, I would like the SDK already prints out and out, and we could make one of the versions of the about that any tap or target built on the SDK prints out is a markdown based setting ref, uh, <laughs> because right now we just it, it is like you'll see that people's readmes get out of date and they're not always capturing all the uh, settings they've got, or, or some just some kind of um, way to to keep the readmes up to date. It's just an idea. I don't know if that would be helpful to people. Uh, we we print it out in text and we can print it out in JSON, but the text one isn't isn't in a format where you can easily copy paste it right now. So, just an idea. Uh, if if that's interesting to everybody, just ch- chime in on um, one of the Slack channels or so. And with that, Ken, do you want to jump over to the? Um, or do you want me to share anything, or do you want to share regarding the productionization deployment stuff? Uh, let me drop a link in the chat and you can at least, um, show the issue. Yeah. The issue description, just so that people get an idea of kind of what, what exactly what I was aiming at. Uh, I'm going to do a full demo of it tomorrow in demo day, but I thought it would be useful to at least sort of, um, uh, share some of the things that I learned, uh, and how it's sort of steering the way that at least. I'm kind of thinking about uh, deployment of Maltano uh, and, and how it might feed into a, a greater plan for Maltano to help with deployments uh, going forward. Awesome. Yeah, I've got it up on screen now. Sweet. Um, so uh, all I was really trying to do was uh, deploy Maltano locally with uh, common tools used in the kind of open source infrastructure management stack. Um, so Terraform, uh, which is uh, very commonly used, uh, is a bit of a gold standard actually for uh, infrastructure management. Um, it has very broad uh, support. Um, it's kind of plugins or provider based. So uh, there are common providers for most technologies and, and all of the, the cloud platforms. Um, so uh, it's, it's great from that respect. You can also run it locally. Um, so you can configure stuff for you locally, which makes it a great uh, entry level tool for. Um, uh, getting together a Terraform uh, set of modules for deploying local resources for testing and development, and then in future, uh, kind of uh, extending that out onto either a cloud platform or um, you can do uh, like local deployments if you've got something like VMware or uh, Kubernetes running in-house, um, you, you can connect up to those things from, from Terraform as well. Um, uh, so Terraform deploys a local Kubernetes cluster. Uh, again, I used the um, Kind uh, tooling. Um, uh, kind deploys Kubernetes into Docker. So uh, you can get away with just having Docker desktop running locally. It'll spin up uh, the cluster that I create is just two containers one for the Kubernetes control plane, one for the worker. Um, and it makes it a sort of really neat way to run Kubernetes without having to manage like virtual machines or um, a mini kube style setup. Um, uh, it uh, then uses Helm to deploy Maltano. Um, my initial approach was to try and take the existing uh, um, airflow managed Helm chart and just like wedge the Maltano uh, invoke command uh, into all of the containers. 
and I very quickly found out that there's this sort of uh, clash between the aims of, of the, the, the two tools. Um, Maltano is very much uh, trying to manage all of the config for you and does a really great job of uh, setting up your environment inside of virtual M, then injecting all of the environment parameters based on what you've got on your Maltano.yaml. And it wants to take full command of, of doing that um, uh, kind of config management for you. In the sort of vanilla Helm world, it's Helm's responsibility to do all of that configuration. It's trying to configure Airflow on, on your behalf. Um, and so I, I very quickly found that uh, managing the two was, was going to be painful. So actually, the Helm chart that I came up with is uh, entirely um, from scratch, although it, it is based very heavily on the Airflow example because it was kind of there. I, I stripped out all of the uh, config management from the Helm chart and delegated uh, the majority of it down to Maltano. Um, there's a couple of instances where um, our Airflow wrapper in Maltano isn't complete, so it, it won't manage the web server. Uh, config.py file for you, and it won't manage the um, pod template file that's required for the Kubernetes executor. So there's a little bit of Docker um, sort of copy that I have to do um, uh, early on. But in future, part of the point of doing the POC was to sort of find these areas where Maltano needs to sort of extend its reach. Um, uh, and so, yeah, from uh, essentially a single Terraform apply, you can get a Kubernetes cluster running locally with the Maltano UI, Airflow, uh, which is web server and scheduler and different pods uh, using the Kubernetes executor. So it will actually launch a new pod for every task. Um, so every uh, invocation of, of Maltano ELT will run in its own pod, completely separated using the Kubernetes executor. Um, you also get a Postgres database backend for both Maltano and Airflow uh, using the same instance, but in two different databases. Uh, and you get an NFS uh, server for Airflow's logs. Um, and this is kind of meant to be, uh, what, what does it take to get Maltano up and running in something that, it, that, that approximates prod? Um, uh, and uh, so yeah, the comments and updates through there give you an idea of the, the sort of journey that I went through. Uh, I think going forward, uh, and um, I think Dawa had some uh, ideas on this uh, that he shared in uh, one of our social conversations recently of um, at what point that we, at what point do we, um, uh, generate this? Is this something that's sort of templated that you run once when you initialize your project and you, depending on the config that you put in um, uh, as part of that initialization, you just get a, a sort of pre-canned set of Terraform and Helm um, uh, templates or uh, modules and charts in their individual uh, lexicons? Um, or is this something that um, Altano will always manage in the way that it currently manages something like Airflow configuration, where the files are generated on the fly based on any changes you've made to your Maltano.yaml um, uh, after the fact? Um, and I think we arrived at, essentially, we need some combination of the two. People need to be able to write their own Terraform modules for describing bits around their environment that may be um, uh, AWS uh, resources, things like S3 buckets or DNS entries or other things that they want to have surrounding their Meltano platform that Meltano isn't necessarily managing for them. Um, uh, but the majority should be um, opinionated deployments that are still configurable, but um, are known to be working if you just leave the, the default config uh, provided by Meltano. Um, how does that, I, I realize I've kind of done all of the spiel in, in one go. How does that sound? And does anyone have any 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 thoughts? I always have thoughts, but don't want to hear me. <laughs> I think it's awesome. Um, we do, we always want to hear you, Derek. Um, so let me see if I got this right. So uh, so Terraform uh, right now, the Terraform module or or um, configuration you have. Uh, will, if if needed or by default, spin up its own Kubernetes cluster. So we, the user doesn't have to generate that. It'll, and that's a Kubernetes cluster on Docker. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so as long as Docker and Terraform are installed, um, all of these other buzzwords that people may or may not know yet uh, uh, will just get turned on in a local environment that's just as easy to turn off. Um, yeah. And then have multiple pieces of the deployment puzzle running and you can inspect them and you can check them out. Um, and the next version or an alternate version of this would be to deploy in a specific cloud um, or on an existing Kubernetes cluster, not caring which cloud it's in. Uh, I could see those two variants. Um, e either, either it cares what cloud it is and it knows, okay, this is how I do this thing in AWS or it doesn't care what cloud it's in, it just expects Kubernetes. Is that kind of how you're thinking? 
Yeah, so the, the way I kind of imagine it is, is, is sort of layer cakes. Um, at, the, at the bottom layer, you have the um, sort of infrastructure layer. It's, it's compute, storage, um, maybe scheduling and orchestration. In some of the clouds, they sort of provide it as a, as a base unit. Um, uh, it's networking. And at those things, uh, we will predominantly use Terraform for. Um, so as you say, if, if, it, if you need to create either an EC2 instance or a Kubernetes cluster, uh, we can provide pre can modules that uh, using um, whatever tools are supported by the clouds to uh, spin up a, a, an EC2 image or a, or a Kubernetes cluster. Then at the next layer where we go to install the services, uh, that's the Meltano UI, uh, Airflow, if that's the configured orchestrator or Diag Serial Prefect when we, when we support those. Um, and so as an end user in my Meltano.yaml, I should be able to select the underlying platform, whether that's like local or EC2 or Kubernetes or uh, sort of some combination of, of the actual kind of running environment and get a set of Terraform assets that correspond to that config and environment. And then I should also be able to select the services in the same way that I, I currently do, right? Like the only thing that's kind of guaranteed is the Maltano UI and then yeah. your orchestrator, maybe your analytics front end, like Lightdash, um, uh, as we saw in your demo uh, recently, uh, these things should be configurable in Meltano.yaml and they will be included in the either the Helm chart uh, if it's a deployment to Kubernetes or some other mechanism if we're, if we're choosing to deploy directly to, to bare metal. Um, and so it, it's kind of uh, the way that I've set it up is um, I have different Helm charts. So a Helm chart for Meltano, which just deploys the Meltano UI, another one for Airflow, um, and Terraform is the, the sort of like master that links them, links them together. I generate essentially a single main.tf file that includes the modules that I want for the infrastructure layer. So that's uh, a, a registry Docker container to push containers to. It's the kind Kubernetes cluster. Um, it could also be a database, something like RDS, um, uh, depending on, as I said, eventually, hopefully generated based on your Meltano.yaml. Uh, and then the Helm charts are just the deployments of, um, uh, as I said, Airflow and Meltano today. But in future, we would have a separate sort of Meltano compatible Helm chart for each of the other services you want to run as part of your, your data platform, including Lightdash or Prefect or Dagster or Great Expectations or any of the DBT, uh, any of the other tools that, that you want you want to be able to run as kind of long lived services uh, inside, inside Meltano. So I want to ask Bogdan, since you mentioned this is an interesting issue for uh, interesting topic for you. Um, uh, well, first of all, um, are Terraform and Kubernetes already in your planned tool chest for your use case? Um, and does this model kind of fit with your um, with your plans? Do you think this is something you might use? I don't know if you're able to add audio, Bogdan. No, no, no. Uh, uh, for the deployment, we are using Docker. We are okay. not using Kubernetes. Um, it's a little weird. The, the form that we are deployment, uh, I wanna explain quickly that it's like we have access to the Odeon database uh, from in one server uh, across uh, VPN. So we run in ECS uh, a Python script that give us access to that server with the VPN um, we are orchestrated that with uh, Airflow, but the Meltano is running in the server uh, that has access to the, the, the origin database. Mm -hmm. So you're using ECS instead of Kubernetes, which is fine. I mean, they're both doing basically the same thing. ECS is a native solution. EK, EKS is Amazon's um, was it Elastic Kubernetes service? I don't know, something. Anyway, it's the Kubernetes for, for AWS. Um, and it sounds like you you said the database you're hitting is uh, that's across the VPN or, or, uh, or um, is did you say that is where you're storing your state and your metadata or is that where your source data is? It's my source database. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's expected. Uh, we expect that your source is running on some external system, either database or API or something. Yeah, so um, it sounds like this could work for your use case, but the question is, would you be willing to move to EKS instead of ECS, or would you want to stay on ECS? Uh, we are in the, in the testing now. Uh, we are trying to 
bond with ECS and try to evaluate other options. So, cool. Yeah. Um, what about the local use case? Would it be helpful to spin something up like this locally um, and be able to see uh, all these things running on your local machine? Is that something you'd be interested in, or or you already have what you need locally? Uh, I I don't have the one in it locally. I I am running all in the deploy uh, deployment uh, ambience. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, if others are watching this in the future or on YouTube, chime in. Um, uh, shoot, I think we're supposed to. I think one of our homework assignments from last week was to like come up with what channel we're going to talk about this in, and I don't know if we did that. Um, are we going to talk about this in Docker or uh, Dao? What do you think? Uh, I was actually going to respond briefly to to Bogdan. Uh, hmm. Still, so what we're talking about here is. If you're using Meltano as basically the foundation of your entire data stack, and you have multiple data stack components kind of running on top of Meltano, which today would be Singer, DBT, and, and uh, Airflow, but we are also looking into supporting Live Dash and a bunch of other tools, then you have this challenge of taking your entire repository that houses your Meltano project and deploying that unit somewhere. And then it becomes really, um, we want to make it really easy to do that by automatically generating the right configuration files to put the entire data project Meltano managed data project on top of Kubernetes, for example. But if you are already running uh, Airflow, uh, as I think you were said you were booked, then, then you definitely don't need to throw away your entire deployment strategy just to be able to use Meltano, because Meltano, if you're only using it for uh, extract, load, and transform, um, you can just install it within the same environment where Airflow is running and use Airflow with the Bash operator to run the Meltano ELT. Um, CLI command with the tap and target and uh, DBT models of your choice. So if you already have Airflow deployed, you can just run Meltano inside Airflow. And it's mostly a challenge of how do you get your Meltano environments into the existing Airflow environment, but that'll depend on how you've currently set it up, which is different from uh, the situation where you want to also use Meltano to actually manage Airflow and everything running inside it, which is where this whole deployment story becomes more relevant. So for anyone watching today who is just using Meltano to run uh, Singer Taps and Targets inside an existing orchestration setup, a lot of what we're talking about isn't relevant yet. But we have this longer term um, kind of vision for Meltano as a data ops platform on top of which you can build your ideal data stack by picking the best in class open source components of your choice with Meltano being responsible for all of the uh, consistent configuration and uh, allowing the entire data stack to be deployed in as a single unit, which means that you can run the entire data stack locally or in CI if you want to have automated tests run or on your production environment. And that's when this how to deploy the Meltano based stack story becomes more relevant. So Bogdan, if you have specific questions about how do I fit Meltano into my existing Airflow installation, then uh, it's probably best to post a thread about that in Slack, and then we can kind of work there on your specific use case, um, which is separate from the, the higher level uh, topic we're discussing here. Let me know if that make, uh, makes sense. Oh, it um, makes sense, although I understand. Uh, yeah, we are only using Meltano for L extraction now. Um, yeah. Yeah, then you definitely don't need to worry about Terraform or Helm or Kubernetes yet. Um, it's going to be a matter of making sure that the Meltano PyPI, uh, like Python plugin, is available within wherever Airflow is running and can be referenced from your Airflow DAX. Uh, and then it should just all kind of work on top of your existing setup. And yeah, if you're I running any issues there, then uh, we can discuss on Slack. That's a really great description, actually, of the the, the sort of different ways that, that people are, are running Meltano today. And and uh, one one thing that kind of sprang to mind was uh, actually it would be really great for um, uh, again thinking about the, the kind of like layer cake architecture to be able to just not deploy a piece, right? If you already have um, an ECS um uh and it's managed for you or it's already in your environment you use it for other things you should just be able to tell Meltano that I've, I've got a compute component don't go off and sp spin me one just just use the one i've got and the same will conceivably be true for some of the managed airflow offerings right like uh the clouds have their own now um there's there's third party ones whole companies that have spun up just for for managing and deploying airflow that um 
organizations may already be using and may want uh, us to just sort of like delegate the airflow component off to. So I think um, I'm hoping that these worlds will kind of meet in the middle, um, but definitely right now, if you, if, as Dawa says, if you're only using um, Meltano uh, for, for doing your EL, um, you don't have to deploy a, a whole stack. In future, if you're coming to uh, the space from scratch and you do want Meltano to own the entire stack, uh, we want to make sure that it's going to be uh, super helpful for you. Do you, are you guys going to move on that more? Is that the plan? Or are you guys not sure? Just kind of messing with it, or which part? Oh no, well, that is definitely our yeah. you know vision. Uh, Meltano, we want Meltano to be the foundation of the modern data stack, and I think there's a lot of value Meltano can add to kind of bring together all these different uh, tools into one kind of project that can be seen as a software development project that can be run in different environments, uh, and and that teams can interact with as if it is any other software development product. We very much think that that is the future of uh, the data space and then what data stacks will look like. And we have a lot of kind of um, more news on that coming in the coming weeks. We're behind the scenes kind of figuring out the communication and the vision and the strategy, strategy around this uh, broader vision for Meltano. Um, in the way we see it, you know, Meltano has always been kind of this, this modular data ops platform that so far just happens to be optimized for three different types of plugins a single types of targets, uh, DBT and Airflow, but there is no limit in the types of plugins we can support. And we ultimately think that we can make um, any combination of data tools better than the sum of their parts by having Meltano manage them as one data product uh, and kind of bringing data ops into the entire life cycle. So Meltano is, is, is thought of as just a data integration tool because the plugins we support so far are focused on uh, ELT and, and then Airflow for orchestration, uh, but that is definitely not how we want Meltano to be perceived if you're uh, looking further ahead than another few months. It's interesting. I, so are you guys thinking like having Kate's ECS support every orchestrator you can imagine support? Or are you guys going to be kind of opinionated on that? Do you, um, do you have any idea where you're thinking or are you just going to? I can yeah, so I mean, uh, no, go ahead, AJ, if you want. Yeah, sorry, I was slow to find the mute button. Um, yeah, I don't think that's feasible. I, I mean, the community can. Um, just the same way the community can handle any any tap or any API out there. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to address every single orchestrator, every single logging platform. What we can do is provide like reference architectures that make it super easy. We can, Meltano can speak a common language with an orchestrator or a scheduler um, or a logging system. And, um, and it might be that like we, we, we spend our time building the kind of these interface layers um, or like a, a, an SDK for interface layers, uh, you know, between how does a, um, you know, how does Helm, Helm like, or something like Helm or Infra from Terraform in, inter, interact with, with Meltano. So part of this is proving the, um, uh, part of this is proving the scenario, proving the use case um so that we can use it community can use it and then we can iterate from there uh i don't know i mean maybe somebody else disagrees that we can cover every single infra deployment option but there's always i assume there are going to be more of them always popping up and uh terraform will eventually get some competition besides Pulumi. maybe there's something else out there i don't know of already but like yeah i, I think we need to pick whatever is best uh supporting the community uh support one or two options and then let the community come in and support a broader set if it if when needed. Yeah, and I think yeah, that, that's a, a, a big point of doing the, the POC is, is just sort of like make it work for, for, for one, one environment um, and then try and generalize it from there. Um, so ideally, uh, we, we would be able to support that. anything that anybody wants to write, um, they, they should be able to use. Um, uh, that's, that would, would always be the ultimate goal. But I think uh, getting there, um, there'll probably be some opinionated configuration on a, a selection of platforms that are commonly used um, that, that we can kind of use to uh, test the waters and, and build the abstractions that, that are needed. Yeah, another example is we don't force you to use Airflow or Meltano scheduling to schedule your jobs. You can use an ECS task connected with a cron or connected with uh, CloudWatch events. Like you can do any kind of orchestration and you will still continue to be able to do any kind of deployment you choose. Uh, we just want to have a little, it may get a little bit less like a wild, wild west and more of like, okay, here's some good options. I can iterate from these. 
Yeah, so I don't think opinionated is the right word because it's not like we want to lock you into any particular uh, platform that you're deploying your Meltano project on top of. But of course, there will be some that we will have kind of better material and, and documentation uh, around. But the way we're thinking of Meltano is, is very much as kind of an infrastructure piece that underpins your data stack and allows you to uh, treat these different data stack components as one product that your data team is responsible for. And then it's up to the data product, to, up to the data team to figure out what is the best way and place to deploy it depending on their own needs. Uh, we will of course be able to make it much, much easier to do that for certain environments than others. But ultimately it's just like, if you're building a web application using Ruby on Rails or Django, um, you can deploy it on anything that can run compute. But of course there will be tutorials and documentation about some platforms more than others. Uh, but we think that Matano can be a really great layer in between the actual kind of compute and uh, you know wherever your 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 container scheduler lives, your Kubernetes, and the specific components that um, a data team pieces together, integrates, configures together to form their data stack. Matano can basically become the, the the shell or the wrapper that makes these disparate components feel as one whole that a data team can work on, like any software development team that's building a product. Uh, because when you are building a data stack, you're not just picking five tools and paying for them and then you're done. You are ultimately a team of engineers that are engineering their ideal data stack by picking the tools that are best for the particular task they're trying to resolve, uh, connecting them, integrating them, writing some custom code in between in, in various cases if you want to have a custom transformation, for example. Uh, and Meltano is the platform that will um, support the team into in, to make that a reality. But uh, a lot of more on this to come in the coming weeks. Um, data integration is kind of the way into Meltano and, and we'll get an opportunity to show people the advantages of data ops and this platform vision we have through uh, the integration of the plugin we support today. But we want Meltano to become a platform that you can use any data, open source data tool on top of. Um, and that takes over a lot of the hurdle or the, the, the challenge of integrating these tools, figuring out how to configure them consistently, figuring out how to have different local and staging and production environments and then different environments for CICD. Um, the entire story of making these individual products part of a product that is owned by a data team is, is the challenge we want to address. Clearly, we still need to figure out some of the communication and positioning on this because I'm not doing the greatest job of explaining it, uh, but that's the direction we'll, that we're thinking in and if we'll start talking about more of the communication. Sounds good. Just seems seems hard, so it's not clear to me. But okay, good luck. <laughs> I, I will I will mention this is not uh, so Ken's new to our team and he's he's kind of taking the lead on this. It's not something we will uh, that will pull us away necessarily from other priorities. We're we're in parallel. We're working on just the stable, like robust, always doing what it should, ELT uh, and other kind of core improvements to the platform. Um, this was kind of, hey, let's strike while the iron's hot because Ken has recent experience on this that is fresh. And we have a lot of demand, frankly, from the community. A lot of people have asked for either reference architectures or examples or deployment plans or, you know, that like we get a lot. How the heck do I deploy Montano? And all we can say is, well, here's somebody who did it. Here's somebody who did it. Have you considered X, Y, Z? What does your infrastructure look like? It would be much better to say, you know, ultimately it's up to you. How do you deploy? But here's an option. Um, and to, today we don't really have that. Here's an option to present people. Charles just shared his view. He said yeah. He couldn't up. Yeah. But I, yeah, I want to, oh wait, sorry, was that? Charles just shared his view. It looks like on infra deployment. He's oh, listening. Cool. He basically uh, said, if there was a reference and I could use your tool, I'd be happy to, I think it was the gist. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Is that from the YouTube chat? Slack. Oh, Slack. Great. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks for that feedback. All right, um, and we'll collect feedback now in the new, I put this in uh, this, the Zoom chat, but if anybody's not in the Zoom chat, we've now created or renamed an existing channel to now be the infra-deployment uh, channel. And hopefully that works for everyone. Uh, anyone wanna raise an objection is easier for us to change now, uh, but does that work for everyone? Thumbs up? Infra-deployment, cool. So uh, that can be just a one-stop shop for whether it's Kubernetes or ECS or whatever. Um, how do we deploy? I'm, there's still a Docker channel because a lot of people are using Docker locally, not related to deployment, but just related to figuring out Docker. Um, and I think that's fine, um, but we might consolidate those as well. We'll see. All right, we're running up on time. Um, I'm excited to see the demo tomorrow, Ken. 
Um, and everyone else uh, who's watching this, uh, please do join um, or watch afterwards if the time doesn't work for you. Um, the demo tomorrow for this uh, first first iteration of the uh, the deployment scenario. Uh, before we drop, we've got five more minutes. Um, Zach, Bogdan, Pat, any other topics you'd like to uh, raise either for now or for next week? No, I'm good. Um, you know, I want to say it was really interesting uh, hearing you all talk about the different problems uh, and also laying out the vision of the company. I thought was pretty fascinating. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate that. Cool. Um, Pat, anything you want to add or uh, ask? No, I'm. I joined late. I was in another meeting, so I'm going to have to go back and watch the YouTube version of this. Sorry, I couldn't uh, contribute. No, no worries at all. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, and everybody, uh, we'll see you in uh, demo day tomorrow or office hours next week. Or Amanda, anything else you want to plug before we drop? Nope. Those are the basics. So we've got demo day tomorrow, same time. Um, and then we do office hours like this every week. Again, same time. Um, you can get the links from us on Slack or on Twitter. Awesome. Thanks very much, everybody. All right. All right. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thanks we'll for see joining. you tomorrow.